Okay. Thank you, Todd. Um, thank you, everyone. And um, before starting, I would like to. So I've been a postdoc here at USC under the guidance of Daniel Lidar for two years, and these are my very last days here, and I'm going to the Perimeter Institute, and I really want to thank uh, Daniel Lidaro, all the other colleagues, Paolo Zanardi, and the, um, Stefan Haas, and Todd Brown, uh, the graduate students I collaborated with for these two beautiful uh, years. And so this is also the, the last uh, talk of the session, so I will keep it sweet and short. Um, and so it's about a new error estimate uh, for a diabetic quantum computation. And <coughs> so luckily, uh, the previous speaker has explained what is a diabetic quantum computation. Uh, so here I will review it very quickly. <coughs> so this is a pretty much a general setting. Imagine we want to minimize a, a function that takes uh, values in R in a domain that is the tensor product of n bits. Then one way is to encode this minimum uh, like the ground state of a Hamiltonian. So for instance, our Hamiltonian is simply the Hamiltonian uh, that has uh, this minimum on the diagonal for every uh, so it has the value of the function on the diagonal elements of, of, of every string of bits here. And of course, the ground state of this Hamiltonian will encode the minimum uh, of this function. Uh, and then we can start from an Hamiltonian H0, whose ground state is uh, easy to prepare, and define an interpolation that depends on time. So at, at time zero, uh, the Hamiltonian is the initial Hamiltonian whose ground state is easy to prepare. At the final time, uh, one, uh, we have the final Hamiltonian whose ground state is the, um, contains the solution to our minimization problem. And here tau is a rescaled time that is uh, a, a function of the real time such that at zero, we have at zero, and at one, we have the total runtime big T. So this is a very general setting. And, and, and this, in, this function can be linear or nonlinear. Uh, and the fact that it can be nonlinear is, is very important, actually. Uh, so the adiabatic theorem says that if we go slow, we stay in the instantaneous ground state along the whole evolution, so eventually we will stay in the ground state of the final Hamiltonian and we will solve our problem. Okay, and so there is this Falk theorem uh, that is, can, yeah, was due, I think, first from Born or can be seen in the landau zener formula, as the previous speaker said, in which it says that uh, the error that we make in, uh, in our state that evolves according to the Schrodinger equation at the final time t, with respect to the instantaneous eigenstate at the, at the time t, uh, somehow is related to the square of the inverse of the gap. So this error is 1 over t, and here we have the, the minimum gap along the whole evolution the square of it. So t must be much bigger than the inverse of the minimum gap squared in order to, to be adiabatic. Uh, okay, here we also have a numerator that somehow counts, right? Because especially if when we have a, a big system with many degrees of freedom, this thing can be big. Uh, it can contribute or it can be small. We don't know. How this Falk theorem, even though in many applications seems working, uh, otherwise it's not very rigorous. In fact, it's known to be wrong. And lately, because of all the interest that comes from adiabatic quantum computation, there has been a revival of rigorous versions of the adiabatic theorems in which it, it has been shown that this doesn't really work. And there are 
okay, here there is a whole zoology of new adiabatic theorems, um, very rigorous, and I will show three of them just to make a point. And so there is the one uh, due to Ben Reichert, and so, so this is more rigorous. Here we have uh, an Hamiltonian that depends on time in a way that is k times differentiable, so it's a very smooth evolution. And so instead of having the matrix elements up here, we have the norm of the derivative, time the derivative of the Hamiltonian. And here we have the total runtime, and again, the gap square plus this quantity that can be made arbitrarily small if we take a very smooth evolution, right? So this is a sort of uh, rigorous version of what I said before, and here we see that we have the norm of this thing. So this, this thing can be pretty large. It, it can basically, for instance, for a spin system, uh, it scales typically like the number of spins under, over the minimum gap. So this estimate would change. It's not just the minimum gap. And here we have other examples. This is due to Ambainis and Regev. And here again, we have these norms with some powers, and we have bigger gaps, uh, bigger powers of the gap, minimum gap. And here there is the um, uh, version given by Ruska, Janssen, and Seiler in a beautiful paper that gives this error estimate. Here we have uh, several pieces with several run, run times and powers of the gaps, and again the norm of these derivatives of the Hamiltonian. So these are very rigorous theorems, and they say that, uh, okay, you, you, first of all you have this gap and then there is the, the norm of this thing and that contains again the gap and the number of degrees of freedom. And when it comes to adiabatic quantum computation, the number of degrees of freedom is irrelevant. We want to know how all these runtimes scale with the number of degrees of freedom that is the size of our problem. Okay, so this is an example. Uh, so we have the Grover's algorithm. We start, we have a spin system. Uh, we start with the equal superposition of all the qubits, and we want to uh, finish in a marked state of all these qubits. So the initial Hamiltonian just contains as a, this term, its ground state is the state at zero, and the final Hamiltonian has the marked qubit that I called here one, but can, could be any of them. So here you see that the norm of the time derivative of the Hamiltonian, in this case, is small. It's bound, it doesn't depend on the numbers of the degrees of freedom. Oh, because the whole Hamiltonian only involves the two states. It's a very simplified situation. And so the only thing that, that scales down the number of spins is the, is the minimum gap that actually goes down like the inverse of the square root of the number of spins. And, but the criterion, given by Ruskai and, and et al. says that, in fact, the error for this simplified case only goes, requires a runtime that goes like the inverse of the gap, not the square of the gap. So this is a big improvement. It's not the square, but it relies on this fact that this term doesn't scale. And you actually can get a much bigger uh, this big improvement, if you basically slow down only when you are close to the minimum gap. All those other versions, I mean, the, the classical folk theorem says it gives you a, a very loose bound. You, you have always to be as low as the minimum gap requires you, but actually this is not necessary. If you just slow down near the minimum gap, then you can obtain this. Okay, so we still have the problem of these norms. And so recently, uh, Daniel Lidar and I stumbled into this beautiful uh, asymptotic expansion for, that gives an uh, adiabatic approximation uh, that is due to Hagedorn and Joy. And it is a bit complicated, but it is so suited for the goals of adiabatic quantum computation that we couldn't help using it. And, so we, we start from the fact, from uh, an expansion of a state in 
So we, we write a state like the series uh, with the small parameter epsilon of n states in the Hilbert space. Now the, the, the result of Agadorn and Joy says that there is always such an expansion uh, that approximates uh, the solution of the Schrodinger equation in this way. So we have a term that contains the norm of the projection of the last part onto the orthogonal complement to Psi and other parts. Okay, so this, so this is uh, a coefficient and this is uh, very small because n here is not in the number of degrees of freedom, it's just how many terms we've put in our series. It's free. So if epsilon is small, we can make this error as small as we want. This is what mathematicians call uh, epsilon to infinity because it's true for every n. It's not as, as good as exponential, but it's faster than any polynomial. So no matter how this norm scales, we can always scale it. Okay, but this is not the adiabatic state, right? This is just a state that approximates very well the solution of the Schrodinger equation. Now, the very good thing is that for under some specific conditions that nevertheless are very uh, easy to implement in the context of uh, adiabatic quantum computing, this psi n just becomes the instantaneous eigenstate. So this becomes an error estimate, not on this generic series, but on our state that we want to create. Okay, so what are these conditions? First of all, the evolution must be smooth, meaning C infinite, but this is always possible. The interpolating terms that we have in the Hamiltonian that are these functions here, the, what is it? Here, the taus, can be made as smooth as possible. There is no limitation in that. The other thing that is necessary to obtain this result is that at initial and final times, all the derivatives of the reduced resolvent are zero. Okay, so this is complicated, but it just means that initially and final times, the Hamiltonian must be kept constant for a little while. Then everything, all the derivatives of the Hamiltonian end of the resolvent are zero, and we can obtain this, but this doesn't really change our runtime. We can just make the Hamiltonian constant for a little bit at the beginning, beginning at the end, and we have this. And the theorem that so far is rigorous says that this error is epsilon to infinity, where epsilon is some time scale of the system. Okay, now what is this time scale? At the worst, can be the minimum gap times the runtime. So this is our answers. This last part is not rigorously proven. It's an answer that for us physicists uh, should be very natural because we are just choosing the worst time scale that we have. Okay, so if we have this, what we obtain, that the error, that now I'm calling delta, for every delta bigger than zero, scales in this way. So there is a prefactor that contains all the information on the norm of the Hamiltonian. And then this, the runtime times the minimum gap to the minus n. So we can always obtain, taking n very big, uh, an error as small as we want with a runtime that scales like one over the inverse of the gap plus something. This something, yeah, contains the error, of course, and contains A that scales with the sets of the system, but it contains N, and this N is free. So we can always make, take N as big as we want. This is the power of having an error that is e e epsilon to the infinity. So we can always kill this space, this piece. And so that the runtime is simply one over the, over the gap, over the minimum gap. No matter how many degrees of freedom there are. Of course, the way the gap scales down the number of degrees of freedom 
uh, still contains the fact that we can have a problem that is difficult to solve. But it's only there. The norm of the Hamiltonian doesn't matter anymore. Uh, and, uh, I guess that is just this. This is another estimate that we could find in the, ca in the case in which we have an analytic interpolation. Well, this is basically due to Hagedorn and Joy, and we are just adapting it. So now this state is, is not the adiabatic state, it's just that expansion. And we have a, not epsilon to infinity, but a real exponential order estimate where this time scale is really the minimum gap times uh, the runtime. This can be proven rigorously, it's not a conjecture. And okay, so this is not useful for adiabatic quantum computation, but it's a very neat error estimate that can be useful for other goals if one likes it. So I am done. are that uh, everything simplifies a lot because, well, first of all, they are improved, the, the, all the estimates for the total runtime, because they are usually one over the square of the minimum gap. There is a paper in which with numerical simulations is proven that in slowing down near the minimum gap, you can get just one over the, of the uh, minimum gap but this is just for a two-level system. Then you always have the problem, oh, but if I have exponentially many channels up there, how do I know that I don't tunnel? Well, this is, we physicists have the intuition that they, they shouldn't count. But yeah, this is basically the proof of it. <laughs> Sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. So all of this is still predicated on sort of having some estimate of that gap. Oh, yeah. Um, how much work is being done on whether that can be at least roughly estimated? Well, that depends ent entirely on the nature of the problem. So, uh, it, it's not a question that you can answer generically. What is the gap in a quantum system? Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, it really depends on the problem. If it's a, a grower problem or optimization problems, they can be exponentially small in the sets of the system. Typical gaps that correspond to quantum phase transitions are usually just the inverse of the sets of the system or a small point. And in other case, nobody knows. It's a difficult problem. There is no unique answer to it. So this is a, uh, an existence proof. So I'm, I'm not showing explicitly how you have to slow down. Uh, you, the intuition is that you have to slow down in proximity of the minimum gap. And, the, and there is a paper that shows it explicitly for the Grover's algorithm uh, by uh, Nicolas Serf and the paper that I quoted, I cited by Ruska et al, and in which you have uh, an interpolation that goes like the arc tan of the parameter. Uh, it, 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 then it just becomes to solve an, a differential equation, really. Bec to, to solve it, you uh, apply the adiabatic criterion instant by instant in a small dt, the and then you have a differential equation, you know. This, this is telling you that it's uh, always possible. Is there, is there any chance you could get really unlucky and have some Hamiltonian where maybe you'd be near a critical point or something so you could actually have a smooth function? Could you require that your, your f of t was smooth? Yeah, I, I was requiring that our controls are controlled that we are 
we can be as smooth as we want in the applications of our external fields. This, this is what I require, yeah. They are classical fields, right? So I can do anything I want. But, I mean, could there ever be a situation where you, you couldn't actually simultaneously satisfy smoothness and, and uh, being uh, no, but, uh, no, because it doesn't depend on the, sp on the spectral properties of the Hamiltonian. Those are just parameters that are in front of the terms. So. It's, it's a physics, I mean, it's an experimental problem if you can do that. But it's, if you can control the, the lasers or the other fields in that way, but it has nothing to do with the spectral properties of the Hamiltonian. Okay, well, let's take Ayesha and all of the speakers.